Section 14 of The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange by Anna Catherine Green. Section 14. Problem 8. Missing page 13. Part 4. The cries of mingled astonishment and relief which greeted this simple elucidation of the mystery were broken by a curiously choked, almost unintelligible cry. It came from the man thus appealed to, who, unnoticed by them all, had started at her first word, and gradually, as action followed action, withdrawn himself till he now stood alone, and in an attitude almost of defiance, behind the large table in the centre of the library i am sorry he began with a brusqueness which gradually toned down into a forced urbanity as he beheld every eye fixed upon him in amazement that circumstances forbid my being of assistance to you in this unfortunate matter if the paper lies where you say and i see no other explanation of its loss i am afraid it will have to remain there for this night at least the cement in which that door is embedded is thick as any wall it would take men with pickaxes, possibly with dynamite, to make a breach there wide enough for anyone to reach in, and we are far from any such help. In the midst of the consternation caused by these words, the clock on the mantel behind his back rang out the hour. It was but a double stroke, but that meant two hours after midnight, and had the effect of a knell in the hearts of those most interested. "'But I am expected to give that formula into the hands of our manager before six o'clock in the morning. "'The steamer sails at a quarter after.' "'Can't you reproduce a copy of it from memory?' someone asked, "'and insert it in its proper place among the pages you hold there. "'The paper would not be the same. "'That would lead to questions, and the truth would come out. "'As the chief value of the process contained in that formula lies in its secrecy, no explanation i could give would relieve me from the suspicions which an acknowledgment of the existence of a third copy however well hidden would entail i should lose my great opportunity mr cornell's state of mind can be imagined in an access of mingled regret and despair he cast a glance at violet who with a nod of understanding left the little room in which they still stood and approached mr van brooklyn lifting up her head for he was very tall and instinctively rising on her toes the nearer to reach his ear she asked in a cautious whisper is there no other way of reaching that place she acknowledged afterwards that for one moment her heart stood still from fear such a change took place in his face though she says he did not move a muscle then just when she was expecting from him some harsh or forbidding word he wheeled abruptly away from her, and, crossing to a window at his side, lifted the shade and looked out. When he returned, he was his usual self so far as she could see. "'There is a way,' he now confided to her in a tone as low as her own. "'But it can only be taken by a child.' "'Not by me?' she asked, smiling down at her own childish proportions. For an instant he seemed taken aback. Then she saw his hand begin to tremble and his lips twitch. Somehow, she knew not why, she began to pity him and asked herself, as she felt rather than saw the struggle in his mind, that here was a trouble which, if once understood, would greatly dwarf that of the two men in the room behind him. "'I am discreet,' she whisperingly declared. "'I have heard the history of that door.' how it was against the tradition of the family to have it opened there must have been some very dreadful reason but old superstitions do not affect me and if you will allow me to take the way you mention i will follow your bidding exactly and will not trouble myself about anything but the recovery of this paper which must lie only a little way inside that blocked-up door was his look one of rebuke at her presumption or just the constrained expression of a perturbed mind probably the latter for while she watched him for some understanding of his mood he reached out his hand and touched one of the satin folds crossing her shoulder 
"'You would soil this irretrievably,' said he. "'There is stuff in the stores for another,' she smiled. Slowly his touch deepened into pressure. Watching him, she saw the crust of some old fear or dominant superstition melt under her eyes, and was quite prepared when he remarked, with what for him was a lightsome air, "'I will buy the stuff if you will dare the darkness and intricacies of our old cellar. I can give you no light. You will have to feel your way according to my direction.' "'I am ready to dare anything.' He left her abruptly. "'I will warn Miss Digby,' he called back. "'She shall go with you as far as the cellar.' Part Five. Violet, in her short career as an investigator of mysteries, had been in many a situation calling for more than womanly nerve and courage. But never, or so it seemed to her at the time, had she experienced a greater depression of spirit than when she stood with Miss Digby before a small door at the extreme end of the cellar, and understood that here was her road, a road which once entered she must take alone. First, it was such a small door no child older than eleven could possibly squeeze through it but she was the size of a child of eleven and might possibly manage that difficulty secondly there are always some unforeseen possibilities in every situation and though she had listened carefully to mr van brooklyn's directions and was sure that she knew them by heart she wished she had kissed her father more tenderly in leaving him that night for the ball and that she had not pouted so undutifully at some harsh stricture he had made. Did this mean fear? She despised the feeling if it did. Thirdly, she hated darkness. She knew this when she offered herself for this undertaking, but she was in a bright room at the moment, and only imagined what she must now face as a reality. But one jet had been lit in the cellar, and that near the entrance. Mr. Van Brooklyn seemed not to need light, even in his unfastening of the small door which Violet was sure had been protected by more than one lock. Doubt, shadow, and a solitary climb between unknown walls, with only a streak of light for her goal, and the clinging pressure of Florence Digby's hand on her own for solace. Surely the prospect was one to tax the courage of her young heart to its limit. But she had promised— and she would fulfil. So, with a brave smile, she stooped to the little door, and in another moment had started her journey. For journey, the shortest distance may seem when every inch means a heart-throb, and one grows old in traversing a foot. At first the way was easy. She had but to crawl up a slight incline, with the comforting consciousness that two people were within reach of her voice, almost within sound of her beating heart but presently she came to a turn beyond which her fingers failed to reach any wall to her left. Then came a step up which she stumbled, and farther on a short flight, each tread of which she had been told to test before she ventured to climb it, lest the decay of innumerable years should have weakened the wood too much to bear her weight. One, two, three, four, five steps! then a landing with an open space beyond. Half of her journey was done. Here she felt she could give a minute to drawing her breath naturally, if the air, unchanged in years, would allow her to do so. Besides, here she had been enjoined to do a certain thing, and to do it according to instructions. Three matches had been given her, and a little night candle. Denied all light up to now, it was at this point she was to light her candle and place it on the floor, so that in returning she should not miss the staircase and get a fall. She had promised to do this, and was only too happy to see a spark of light scintillate into life in the immeasurable darkness. She was now in a great room long closed to the world, where once officers in colonial wars had feasted, and more than one council had been held. A room, too, which had seen more than one tragic happening, as its almost unparalleled isolation proclaimed. So much Mr. Van Brooklyn had told her, but she was warned to be careful in traversing it, and not upon any pretext to swerve aside from the right-hand wall till she came to a huge mantelpiece. 
this passed and a sharp corner turned she ought to see somewhere in the dim spaces before her a streak of vivid light shining through the crack at the bottom of the blocked-up door the paper should be somewhere near this streak all simple all easy of accomplishment if only that streak of light were all she was likely to see or think of if the horror which was gripping her throat should not take shape if things would remain shrouded in impenetrable darkness and not force themselves in shadowy suggestion upon her excited fancy but the blackness of the passageway through which she had just struggled was not to be found here whether it was the effect of that small flame flickering at the top of the staircase behind her or of some change in her own powers of seeing surely there was a difference in her present outlook tall shapes were becoming visible the air was no longer blank she could see then suddenly she saw why in the wall high up to her right was a window it was small and all but invisible being covered on the outside with vines and on the inside with the cobwebs of a century but some small gleams from the starlight night came through making phantasms out of ordinary things which unseen were horrible enough and half seen choked her heart with terror i cannot bear it she whispered to herself even while creeping forward her hand upon the wall i will close my eyes was her next thought i will make my own darkness and with a spasmodic forcing of her lids together she continued to creep on passing the mantelpiece where she knocked against something which fell with an awful clatter this sound followed as it was by that of smothered voices from the excited group awaiting the result of her experiment from behind the impenetrable wall she should be nearing now if she had followed her instructions aright freed her instantly from her fancies and opening her eyes once more she cast a look ahead and to her delight saw but a few steps away the thin streak of bright light which marked the end of her journey it took her but a moment after that to find the missing page and picking it up in haste from the dusty floor she turned herself quickly about and joyfully began to retrace her steps why then was it in the course of a few minutes more her voice suddenly broke into a wild unearthly shriek which ringing with terror burst the bounds of that dungeon-like room and sank a barbed shaft into the breasts of those awaiting the result of her doubtful adventure at either end of this dread no thoroughfare what had happened if they had thought to look out they would have seen that the moon held in check by a bank of cloud occupying half the heavens had suddenly burst its bounds and was sending long bars of revealing light into every uncurtained window part six florence digby in her short and sheltered life had possibly never known any very great or deep emotion but she touched the bottom of extreme terror at that moment as with her ears still thrilling with violet's piercing cry she turned to look at mr van brooklyn and beheld the instantaneous wreck it had made of this seemingly strong man not till he came to lie in his coffin would he show a more ghastly countenance and trembling herself almost to the point of falling caught him by the arm and sought to read his face what had happened something disastrous she was sure something which he had feared and was partially prepared for yet which in happening had crushed him was it a pitfall into which the poor little lady had fallen if so but he is speaking mumbling low words to himself some of them she can hear he is reproaching himself repeating over and over that he should never have taken such a chance that he should have remembered her youth the weakness of a young girl's nerve he had been mad and now and now with the repetition of this word his murmuring ceased all his energies were now absorbed in listening at the low door separating him from what he was agonizing to know a door impossible to enter impossible to enlarge a barrier to all help an opening whereby sound might pass but nothing else save her own small body now lying where is she hurt faltered florence stooping herself to listen can you hear anything anything for an instant he did not answer every faculty was absorbed in the one sense 
then slowly and in gasps he began to mutter i think i hear something her step no 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 step all is as quiet as death not a sound not a breath she has fainted oh god oh god why this calamity on top of all he had sprung to his feet at the utterance this invocation but next moment was down on knees again listening listening never was silence more profound they were hearkening for murmurs from a tomb florence began to sense the full horror of it all and was swaying helplessly when mr van brooklyn impulsively lifted his hand in an admonitory hush and through the daze of her faculties a small far sound began to make itself heard growing louder as she waited then becoming faint again then altogether ceasing only to renew itself once more till it resolved into an approaching step faltering in its course but coming ever nearer and nearer she's safe she's not hurt sprang from florence's lips in inexpressible relief and expecting mr van brooklyn to show an equal joy she turned towards him with a cheerful cry now if she has been so fortunate as to that missing page we shall all be repaid for our fright a movement on his part a shifting of position which brought him finally to his feet but he gave no other proof of having heard her nor did his countenance mirror her relief it is as if he dreaded instead of hailed her return was florence's inward comment as she watched him involuntarily recoil at each fresh token of violence advance yet because this seemed so very unnatural she persisted in her efforts to lighten the situation and when he made no attempt to encourage violet in her approach she herself stooped and called out a cheerful welcome which must have rung sweetly in the poor little detective's ears a sorry sight was violet when helped by florence she finally crawled into view through the narrow opening and stood once again on the cellar floor pale trembling and soiled with the dust of years she presented a helpless figure enough till the joys in florence's face recalled some of her spirit and glancing down at her hand in which a sheet of paper was visible she asked for mr spielhagen i've got the formula she said if you will bring him i will hand it over to him not a word of her adventure nor so much as one glance at mr van brooklyn standing far back in the shadows nor was she more communicative when the formula restored and everything made right with mr spielhagen they all came together again in the library for a final word i was frightened by the silence and the darkness and so cried out she explained in answer to their questions any one would have done so who found himself alone in so musty a place she added with an attempt at lightsomeness which deepened the pallor on mr van brooklyn's cheek already sufficiently noticeable to have been remarked upon by more than one no ghosts laughed mr cornell too happy in the return of his hopes to be fully sensible of the feelings of those about him no whispers from impalpable lips or touches from spectre hands nothing to explain the mystery of that room long shut up that even mr van brooklyn declares himself ignorant of its secret nothing returned violet showing her dimples in full force now if miss strange had any such experiences if she has anything to tell worthy of so marked as curiosity she will tell it now came from the gentleman just alluded to in terms so stern and strange that all show of frivolity ceased on the instant have you anything to tell miss strange greatly startled she regarded him with widening eyes for a moment then with a move towards the door remarked with a general look about her mr van brooklyn knows his own house and doubtless can relate its histories if he will i am a busy little body who have finished my work and am now ready to return home there to wait for the next problem which an indulgent fate may offer me she was near the threshold she was about to take her leave when suddenly she felt two hands fall on her shoulder and turning met the eyes of mr van brooklyn burning into her own you saw dropped in an almost inaudible whisper from his lips 
the shiver which shook her answered him better than any word with an exclamation of despair he withdrew his hands and facing the others now standing together in a startled group he said as soon as he could recover some of his self-possession i must ask for another hour of your company i can no longer keep my sorrow to myself a dividing line has just been drawn across my life and i must have the sympathy of someone who knows my past or i shall go mad in my self-imposed solitude come back miss Jange. you of all others have the prior right to hear part seven i shall have to begin said he when they were all seated and ready to listen by giving you some idea not so much of the family tradition as of the effect of this tradition upon all who bore the name of van brooklyn this is not the only house even in america which contains a room shut away from intrusion in england there are many but there is this difference between most of them and ours no bars or locks forcibly held shut the door we were forbidden to open the command was enough that and the superstitious fear which such a command attended by a long and unquestioning obedience was likely to engender i know no more than you do why some early ancestor laid his ban upon this room but from my earliest years i was given to understand that there was one latch in the house which was never to be lifted that any fault would be forgiven sooner than that fault that the honour of the whole family stood in the way of disobedience and that i was to preserve that honour to my dying day you will say that all this is fantastic and wonder that sane people in these modern times would subject themselves to such a ridiculous restriction especially when no good reason was alleged and the very source of the tradition from which it sprung forgotten you are right but if you look long into human nature you will see that the bonds which hold the firmest are not material ones that an idea will make a man and mould a character that it lies at the source of all heroisms and is to be courted or feared as the case may be for me it possessed a power proportionate to my loneliness i don't think there was ever a more lonely child my father and mother were so unhappy in each other's companionship that one or other of them was almost always away but i saw little of either even when they were at home the constraint on their attitude towards each other affected their conduct towards me i have asked myself more than once if either of them had any real affection for me to my father i spoke of her to her of him and never pleasurably this i am forced to say or you cannot understand my story would to god i could tell another tale would to god i had such memories as other men have of a father's clasp a mother's kiss but no my grief already profound might have become abysmal perhaps it is best as it is only i might have been a different child and made for myself a different fate who knows as it was i was thrown almost entirely upon my own resources for my amusement this led me to a discovery i made one day in a far part of the cellar behind some heavy casks i found a little door it was so low so exactly fitted to my small body that i had the greatest desire to enter it but i could not get around the casks at last an expedient occurred to me we had an old servant who came nearer loving me than any one else one day when i chanced to be alone in the cellar i took out my ball and began throwing it about finally it landed behind the casks and i ran with a beseeching cry to michael to move it it was a task requiring no little strength and address but he managed after a few herculean efforts to shift them aside and i saw with delight my way opened to that mysterious little door but i did not approach it then some instinct deterred me but when the opportunity came for me to venture there alone i did so in the most adventurous spirit and began my operations by sliding behind the casks and testing the handle of the little door it turned and after a pull or two the door yielded with my heart in my mouth i stooped and peered in i could see nothing a black hole and nothing more this caused me a moment's hesitation i was afraid of the dark had always been but curiosity and the spirit of adventure triumphed saying to myself that i was robinson crusoe exploring the cave i crawled in only to find that i had gained nothing 
it was as dark inside as it had looked to be from without there was no fun in this so i crawled back and when i tried the experiment again it was with a bit of candle in my hand and a surreptitious match or two what i saw when with a trembling little hand i lighted one of the matches would have been disappointing to most boys but not to me the litter and old boards i saw in odd corners about me were full of possibilities while in the dimness beyond i seemed to perceive a sort of staircase which might leave i do not think i made any attempt to answer that question even in my own mind but when after some hesitation and a sense of great daring i finally crept up those steps i remember very well my sensation at finding myself in front of a narrow closed door i sensed too vividly the one in grandfather's little room the door in the wainscot which we were never to open i had my first real trembling fit here and at once fascinated and repelled by this obstruction i stumbled and lost my candle which going out in the fall left me in total darkness and a very frightened state of mind for my imagination which had been greatly stirred by my own vague thoughts of the forbidden room immediately began to people the space about me with ghoulish figures how should i escape them however reach my own little room again undetected and in safety but these terrors deep as they were were nothing to the real fright which seized me when the darkness finally braved and the way found back into the bright wide open halls of the house i became conscious of having dropped something besides the candle my match-box was gone not my match-box but my grandfather's which i had found lying on his table and carried off on this adventure in all the confidence of irresponsible youth to make use of it for a little while trusting to his not missing it in the confusion i had noticed about the house that morning was one thing to lose it was another it was no common box made of gold and cherished for some special reason well known to himself i had often heard him say that some day i would appreciate its value and be glad to own it and i had left it in that hole and at any minute he might miss it possibly ask for it the day was one of torment my mother was away or shut up in her room my father i don't know just what thoughts i had about him he was not to be seen either and the servants cast strange looks at me when i spoke his name but i little realized the blow which had just fallen upon the house in his definite departure and only thought of my own trouble and of how i should meet my grandfather's eye when the hour came for him to draw me to his knee for his usual good-night that i was spared this ordeal for the first time this very night first comforted me then added to my distress he had discovered his loss and was angry on the morrow he would ask me for the box and i would have to lie for never could i find the courage to tell him where i had been such an act of presumption he would never forgive or so i thought as i lay and shivered on my little bed that his coldness his neglect sprang from the discovery just made that my mother as well as my father had just fled the house for ever was as little known to me as the morning calamity i had been given my usual tendance and was tucked safely into bed but the gloom the silence which presently settled upon the house had a very different explanation in my mind from the real one my sin for such it loomed large in my mind by this time coloured the whole situation and accounted for every event at what hour i slipped from my bed on to the cold floor i shall never know to me it seemed to be in the dead of night but i doubt if it were more than ten so slowly creep away the moments to a wakeful child i had made a great resolve awful as the prospect seemed to me frightened as i was by the very thought i had determined in my small mind to go down into the cellar and into that midnight hole again in search of the lost box i would take a candle and matches this time from my own mantel shelf and if every one was asleep as appeared from the deathly quiet of the house i would be able to go and come without anybody ever being the wiser dressing in the dark i found my matches and my candle and putting them in one of my pockets softly opened my door and looked out nobody was stirring every light was out except a solitary one in the lower hall 
that this still burned conveyed no meaning to my mind how could i know that the house was so still and the rooms dark because every one was out searching for some clue to my mother's flight if i had looked at the clock but i did not i was too intent upon my errand too filled with the fever of my desperate undertaking to be affected by anything not bearing directly upon it of the terror caused by my own shadow on the wall as i made the turn in the hall below i have as keen a recollection to-day as though it happened yesterday but that did not deter me nothing deterred me till safe in the cellar i crouched down behind the casks to get my breath again before entering the hole beyond i had made some noise in feeling my way around these casks and i trembled lest these sounds had been heard upstairs but this fear soon gave place to one far greater other sounds were making themselves heard a din of small scurrying feet above below on every side of me rats rats in the wall rats in the cellar bottom how i ever stirred from the spot i do not know but when i did stir it was to go forward and enter the uncanny hole i had intended to light my candle when i got inside but for some reason i went stumbling along in the dark following the wall till i got to the steps where i had dropped the box here a light was necessary but my hand did not go to my pocket i thought it better to climb the steps first and softly one foot found the tread and then another i had only three more to climb and then my right hand now feeling its way along the wall would be free to strike a match i climbed the three steps and was steadying myself against the door for a final plunge when something happened something so strange so unexpected and so incredible that i wonder i did not shriek aloud in my terror the door was moving under my hand it was slowly opening inward i could feel the chill made by the widening crack moment by moment this chill increased the gap was growing a presence was there a presence before which i sank in a small heap upon the landing would it advance had it feet hands was it a presence which could be felt whatever it was it made no attempt to pass and presently i lifted my head only to quake anew at the sound of a voice a human voice my mother's voice so near me that by putting out my hands i might have touched her i have come she said they think i have fled the house and are looking far and wide for me we shall not be disturbed who would think of looking here for either you or me here the words sank like a plummet in my breast i had known for some few minutes that i was on the threshold of the forbidden room but they were in it i can scarcely make you understand the tumult which this awoke in my brain somehow i had never thought that any such braving of the house's law would be possible i heard my father's answer but it conveyed no meaning to me i also realized that he spoke from a distance that he was at one end of the room while we were at the other i was presently to have this idea confirmed for while i was striving with all my might and main to subdue my very heart-throbs so that she would not hear me or suspect my presence the darkness i should rather say the blackness of the place yielded to a flash of lightning heat lightning all glare and no sound and i caught an instantaneous vision of my father's figure standing with gleaming things about him which affected me at the moment as supernatural but which in later years i decided to have been weapons hanging on a wall she saw him too for she gave a quick laugh and said they would not need any candles and then there was another flash and i saw something in his hand and something in hers and though i did not yet understand i felt myself turning deathly sick and gave a choking gasp which was lost in the rush she made into the centre of the room and the keenness of her swift low cry garde toi for only one of us will ever leave this room alive a duel a duel to the death between this husband and wife this father and mother in this hole of dead tragedies and within the sight and hearing of their child has satan ever devised a scheme more hideous for ruining the life of an eleven-year-old boy not that i took it all in at once i was too innocent and much too dazed to comprehend such hatred much less the passions which engender it 
I only knew that something horrible, something beyond the conception of my childish mind, was going to take place in the darkness before me, and the terror of it made me speechless. Would to God it had made me deaf and blind and dead. She had dashed from her corner, and he had slid away from his, as the next fantastic glare which lit up the room showed me. It also showed the weapons in their hands, and for a moment I felt reassured when I saw that these were swords, for I had seen them before with foils in their hands practising for exercise, as they said, in the great garret. But the swords had buttons on them, and this time the tips were sharp and shone in the keen light. An exclamation from her and a growl of rage from him were followed by movements I could scarcely hear, but which were terrifying from their very quiet. Then the sounds of a clash. The swords had crossed. Had the lightning flashed forth then, the end of one of them might have occurred, but the darkness remained undisturbed, and when the glare relit the great room again, they were already far apart. This called out a word from him. This one sentence he spoke. I can never forget it. Rhoda, there is blood on your sleeve. I have wounded you. Shall we call it off and fly? as the poor creatures in there think we have to the opposite ends of the earth i almost spoke i almost added my childish plea to his for them to stop to remember me and stop but not a muscle in my throat responded to my agonized effort her cold clear no fell before my tongue was loosed or my heart freed from the ponderous weight crushing it i have vowed and i keep my promises she went on in a quiet tone strange to me what would either's life be worth with the other alive and happy in this world he made no answer and those subtle movements shadows of movements i might almost call them recommenced then there came a sudden cry shrill and poignant had grandfather been in his room he would surely have heard it and the flash coming almost simultaneously with its utterance i saw what has haunted my sleep from that day to this my father pinned against the wall sword still in hand and before him my mother fiercely triumphant her staring eyes fixed on his and nature could bear no more the band loosened from my throat the oppression lifted from my breast long enough for me to give one wild wail and she turned saw heaven sent its flashes quickly at this moment and recognizing my childish form or the horror of her deed or so i have fondly hoped rose within her and she gave a start and fell full upon the point upturned to receive her a groan then a gasping sigh from him and silence settled upon the room and upon my heart and so far as i knew upon the whole created world that is my story friends do you wonder that i have never been or lived like other men after a few moments of sympathetic silence mr van brooklyn went on to say i don't think i ever had a moment's doubt that my parents both lay dead on the floor of that great room when i came to myself which may have been soon and may not have been for a long while the lightning had ceased to flash leaving the darkness stretching like a blank pall between me and that spot in which were concentrated all the terrors of which my imagination was capable i dared not enter it i dared not take one step that way my instinct was to fly and hide my trembling body again in my own bed and associated with this in fact dominating it and making me old before my time was another never to tell never to let any one least of all my grandfather know what that forbidden room now contained i felt in an irresistible sort of way that my father's and mother's honour was at stake besides terror held me back i felt that i should die if i spoke childhood has such terrors and such heroisms silence often covers in such abysses of thought and feeling which astonish us in later years there is no suffering like a child's terrified by a secret which it dare not for some reason disclose events aided me when in desperation to see once more the light and all the things which linked me to life my little bed the toys on the window-sill my squirrel in its cage 
I forced myself to retraverse the empty house, expecting at every turn to hear my father's voice, or come upon the image of my mother. Yes, such was the confusion of my mind, though I knew well enough, even then, that they were dead, and that I should never hear the one or see the other. I was so benumbed with the cold in my half-dressed condition, that I woke in a fever next morning after a terrible dream, which forced from my lips the cry of, Mother! Mother! Only that. I was cautious, even in delirium. This delirium and my flushed cheeks and shining eyes led them to be very careful of me. I was told that my mother was away from home, and when, after two days of search, they were quite sure that all effort to find either her or my father were likely to prove fruitless, that she had gone to Europe, where we would follow her as soon as I was well. This promise, offering as it did a prospect of immediate release from the terrors which were consuming me, had an extraordinary effect upon me. I got up out of my bed, saying that I was well now, and ready to start on the instant. The doctor, finding my pulse equable, and my whole condition wonderfully improved, and attributing it, as was natural, to my hope of soon joining my mother, advised my whim to be humoured, and this hope kept alive till travel and intercourse with children should give me strength and prepare me for the bitter truth ultimately awaiting me. They listened to him, and in twenty-four hours our preparations were made. We saw the house close. With what emotion surging in one small breast I leave you to imagine, and then started on our long tour. For five years we wandered over the continent of Europe, my grandfather finding distraction, as well as myself, in foreign scenes and associations. But return was inevitable. What I suffered on re-entering this house, God and my sleepless pillow alone know. Had any discovery been made in our absence, or would it be made now that renovations and repairs of all kinds were necessary? Time finally answered me. My secret was safe, and likely to continue so. And this fact once settled, life became endurable, if not cheerful. Since then, I have spent only two nights out of this house, and they were unavoidable. When my grandfather died, I had the wainscot door cemented in. It was done from this side, and the cement painted to match the wood. No one opened the door, nor have I ever crossed the threshold. Sometimes I think I have been foolish, and sometimes I know that I have been very wise. My reason has stood firm. How do I know that it would have done so if I had subjected myself to the possible discovery that one or both of them might have been saved if I had disclosed instead of concealed my adventure? a pause during which white horror had shone on every face. Then, with a final glance at Violet, he said, "'What sequel do you see to this story, Miss Strange? I can tell the past. I leave you to picture the future.' Rising, she let her eye travel from face to face till it rested on the one awaiting it, when she answered dreamily, "'If some morning in the news column there should appear an account of the ancient and historic home of the Van Brooklyns having burned to the ground in the night, the whole country would mourn, and the city feel defrauded of one of its treasures. But there are five persons who would see in it the sequel which you ask for. When this happened, as it did happen, some few weeks later, the astonishing discovery was made that no insurance had been put upon this house. Why was it? that after such a loss Mr. Van Brooklyn seemed to renew his youth. It was a constant source of comment among his friends. End of Problem 8 End of Section 14section fifteen of the golden slipper and other problems for violet strange this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen the golden slipper and other problems for violet strange by anna katherine green section fifteen violet's own it has been too much for you i am afraid so it was roger upjohn who had asked the question it was violet who answered 
they had withdrawn from a crowd of dancers to a balcony half shaded half open to the moon a balcony made it would seem for just such stolen interviews between waltzes now as it happened roger's face was in the shadow but violet's in the full light very sweet it looked very erythral but also a little wan he noticed this and impetuously cried you are pale and your hand see how it trembles slowly withdrawing it from the rail where it had rested she sent one quick glance his way and in a low voice said i have not slept since that night four days he murmured then after a moment of silence you bore yourself so bravely at the time i thought or rather i hoped that success had made you forget the horror i could not have slept myself if i had known it is part of the price i pay she broke in gently all good things have to be paid for but i see i realize that you do not consider what i am doing good though it helps other people has helped you you wonder why with all the advantages i possess i should meddle with matters so repugnant to a woman's natural instincts yes he wondered that was evident from his silence seeing her as she stood there so quaintly pretty so feminine in look and manner in short such a flower it was but natural that he should marvel at the incongruity she had mentioned it was a strange odd look she admitted after a moment of troubled hesitation the most considerate person cannot but regard it as a display of egotism or of a most mercenary spirit the check you sent me for what i was enabled to do for you in massachusetts the only one which i have ever received which i have been tempted to refuse shows to what extent you rated my help and my my expectations had i been a poor girl struggling for subsistence this generosity would have warmed my heart as a token of your desire to cut that struggle short but taken with your knowledge of my home and its luxuries it has often made me wonder what you thought shall i tell you he had stepped forward at this question and his countenance hitherto concealed became visible in the moonlight she no longer recognized it transformed by feeling it shone down upon her instinct with all that is finest and best in masculine nature was she ready for this revelation of what she had nevertheless dreamed of for many more nights than four she did not know and instinctively drew herself back till it was she who now stood in the semi-obscurity made by the drooping vines from this retreat she faltered forth a very tremulous no which in another moment was disavowed by a yes so faint it was little more than a murmur followed by a still fainter tell me but he did not seem in any haste to obey sweetly as her low-toned injunction must have sounded in his ears on the contrary he hesitated to speak growing paler every minute as he sought to catch a glimpse of her downcast face so tantalizingly hidden from him did she recognize the nature of the feelings which held him back or was she simply gathering up sufficient courage to plead her own cause whatever her reason it was she not he who presently spoke saying as if no time had elapsed but first i feel obliged to admit that it was money i wanted that i had to have not for myself i lack nothing and could have more if i wished father has never limited his generosity in any manner affecting myself but she drew a deep breath and coming out of the shadow lifted a face to him so changed from its usual expression as to make him start i have a cause at heart one which should appeal to my father and does not and for that purpose i have sacrificed myself in many ways though though i have not disliked my work up to this last attempt not really i want to be honest and so must admit that much i have even gloried quietly and all by myself of course over the solution of a mystery which no one else seemed able to penetrate i am made that way i have known it ever since but that is a story all by itself if some day i may tell it to you 
but not now no not now the emphasis sent the colour into her cheek but did not relieve his pallor miss strange i have always felt even in my worst days that the man who for selfish ends brought a woman under the shadow of his own unhappy reputation was a man to be despised and i think so still and yet and yet nothing in the world but your own word or look can hold me back now from telling you that i love you love you notwithstanding my unworthy past my scarring memories my all but blasted hopes i do not expect any response you are young you are beautiful you are gifted with every grace but to speak to say over and over again i love you i love you eases my heart and makes my future more endurable oh do not look at me like that unless unless but the bright head did not fall nor the tender gaze falter and driven out of himself roger upjohn was about to step passionately forward when seized by fresh compunction he hoarsely cried it is not right the balance dips too much my way you bring me everything i can give you nothing but what you already possess abundance love and money besides your father she interrupted him with a glance at once arch and earnest i had a talk with father this morning he came to my room and and it was very near being serious some one had told him i was doing things on the sly which he had better look into and of course he asked questions and and i answered them he wasn't pleased in fact he was very displeased i don't think we can blame him for that but we had no open break for i love him dearly for all my opposing ways and he saw that and it helped though he did say after i had given my promise to stop where i was and never to take up such work again that here she stole a shy look at the face bent so eagerly towards her that i had lost my social status and he never hoped now for the attention of of well of such men as he admires and puts faith in so you see her dimples all showing that i am not such a very good match for an upjohn of massachusetts even if he has a reputation to recover and an honourable name to achieve the scale hangs more evenly than you think violet a mutual look a moment of perfect silence then a low whisper airy as the breath of flowers rising from the garden below i have never known what happiness was till this moment if you will take me with my story untold take you take you the man's whole yearning heart the lost and bitterness of years the hope and promise of the future all spoke in that low half smothered exclamation violet's blushes faded under its fervency and only her spirit spoke as leaning towards him she laid her two hands in his and said with all a woman's earnestness i do not forget little roger or the father who i hope may have many more days before him in which to bid good-night to the sea such union as ours must be hallowed because we have so many persons to make happy besides ourselves the evening before their marriage violet put a dozen folded sheets of closely written paper in his hand they contained her story let us read it with him dear roger i could not have been more than seven years old when one night i woke up shivering at the sound of angry voices a conversation which no child should ever have heard was going on in the room where i lay my father was talking to my sister perhaps you do not know that i have a sister few of my personal friends do and the terror she evinced i could well understand but not his words nor the real cause of his displeasure there are times even yet when the picture forced upon my infantile consciousness at that moment of first awakening comes back to me with all its original vividness there was no light in the room save such as the moon made but that was enough to reveal the passion burningly alive in either face as bending towards each other she in supplication and he in a tempest of wrath which knew no bounds 
he uttered and she listened to what i now know to have been a terrible arraignment i may have an interesting countenance you have told me so sometimes but she she was beautiful my elder by ten years she had stood in my mother's stead to me for almost as long as i could remember and as i saw her lovely features contorted with pain and her hands extended in a desperate plea to one who had never shown me anything but love my throat closed sharply and i could not cry out though i wanted to nor move head or foot though i longed with all my heart to bury myself in the pillows for the words i heard were terrifying little as i comprehended their full purport he had surprised her talking from her window to some one down below and after saying cruel things about that he shouted out you have disgraced me you have disgraced yourself you have disgraced your brother and your little sister was it not enough that you should refuse to marry the good man i had picked out for you that you should stoop to this low-down scoundrel this i did not hear what else he called him i was wondering so to whom she had been stooping i had never seen her stoop except to tie my little shoes but when she cried out as she did after an interval i love him i love him then i listened again for she spoke as though she were in dreadful pain and i did not know that loving made one ill and unhappy and i am going to marry him i heard her add standing up as she said it very straight and tall mary i knew what that meant a long aisle in a church women in white and big music in the air behind i had been flower girl at a wedding once and had not forgotten we had ice cream and cake and but my childish thoughts stopped short at the answer she received and all the words which followed words which burned their way into my infantile brain and left scorched places in my memory which will never be eradicated he spoke them spoke them all she never answered again after that once and when he was gone did not move for a long time and when she did it was to lie down stiff and straight just as she had stood on her bed alongside mine i was frightened so frightened my little brass bed rattled under me i wonder she did not hear it but she heard nothing and after a while she was so still i fell asleep but i woke again something hot had fallen on my cheek i put up my hand to brush it away and did not know even when i felt my fingers wet that it was a tear from my sister mother's eye for she was kneeling then kneeling close beside me and her arm was over my small body and the bed was shaking again but not this time with my tremors only and i was sorry and cried too until i dropped off to sleep again with her arm still passionately embracing me in the morning she was gone it must have been that very afternoon that father came in where arthur and i were trying to play trying but not quite succeeding for i had been telling arthur for whom i had a great respect in those days what had happened the night before and we had been wondering in our childish way if there would be a wedding after all and a church full of people and flowers and kissing and lots of good things to eat and arthur had said no it was too expensive that that was why father was so angry and comforted by the assertion i was taking up my doll again when the door opened and father stepped in it was a great event any visit from him to the nursery and we both dropped our toys and stood staring not knowing whether he was going to be nice and kind as he sometimes was or scold us as i had heard him scold our beautiful sister arthur showed at once what he thought for without the least hesitation he took the one step which placed him in front of me where he stood waiting with his two little fists hanging straight at his sides but manfully clinched in full readiness for attack that this display of pygmy chivalry was not quite without its warrant is evident to me now for father did not look like himself or act like himself any more than he had the night before however we had no cause for fear having no suspicion of my having been awake during his terrible interview with theresa he saw only two lonely and forsaken children interrupted in their play 
can i remember what he said to us not exactly though arthur and i often went over it choked whispers in some secret nook of the dreary old house but his meaning that we took in well enough teresa had left us she would never come back we were not to look out of the window for her or run to the door when the bell rang our mother had left us too a long time ago and she lay in the cemetery where we sometimes carried flowers teresa was not in the cemetery but we must think of her as there though not as if she had any need of flowers having said this he looked at us quietly for a minute arthur was trying very hard not to cry but i was sobbing like the lost child i was with my cheek against the floor where i had thrown myself when he said that awful thing about the cemetery she there my sister mother there i think he felt a little sorry for me for he half stooped as if to lift me up but he straightened again and said very sternly now children listen to me when god takes people to heaven and leaves us only their cold dead bodies we carry flowers to their graves and talk about them some if not very much but when people die because they love dark ways better than light then we do not remember them with gifts and we do not talk about them your sister's name has been spoken for the last time in this house you arthur are old enough to know what i mean when i say that i will never listen to another word about her from either you or violet as long as you and i live she is gone and nothing that is mine shall she ever touch again you hear me arthur you hear me violet heed me or you go too his aspect was terrible so was his purpose much more terrible than we realized at the time with our limited understanding and experience later we came to know the full meaning of this black drop which had been infused into our lives when we saw every picture of her destroyed which had been in the house her name cut out from the leaves of books the little tokens she had given us surreptitiously taken away till not a vestige of her once beloved presence remained we began to realize that we had indeed lost her but children as young as we were then do not long retain the poignancy of their first griefs gradually my memories of that awful night ceased to disturb my dreams and i was sixteen before they were again recalled to me with any vividness and then it was by accident i had been strolling through a picture gallery and had stopped short to study more particularly one which had especially taken my fancy there were two ladies sitting on a bench behind me and one of them was evidently very deaf for their talk was loud though i am sure they did not mean for me to hear for they were discussing my family that is one of them had said that's violet strange she will never be the beauty her sister was but perhaps that's not to be deplored teresa made a great mess of it that's true i hear that she and the signor have been seen lately here in town in poverty of course he hadn't even as much go in him as the ordinary singing master i suppose i should have hurried away and left this barbed arrow to rankle where it fell but i could not i had never learned a word of teresa's fate and that word poverty proving that she was alive and suffering held me to my place to hear what more they might say of her who for years had been for me an indistinct figure bathed in cruel moonlight i have never approved of peter strange's conduct at that time one of the voices now went on he didn't handle her right she had a lovely disposition and would have listened to him had he been more gentle with her but it isn't in him i hope this one i didn't hear the end of that i had no interest in anything they might say about myself it was of her i wanted to hear of her weren't they going to say anything more about my poor sister yes it was a topic which interested both and presently i heard he'll never do anything for her no matter what happens i've heard him say so 
and laura has vowed the same laura is our aunt besides teresa has a pride of her own equal to her father's she wouldn't take anything from him now she'd rather struggle on i'm told i don't know how true it is that she's working in a department store one of the sixth avenue ones oh there's mrs van de graff don't you want to speak to her they moved off leaving me still gazing with unseeing eyes at the picture before which i stood planted and saying over and over in monotonous iteration one of the department stores in sixth avenue which department store i meant to find out i do not know whether up till then i had had the least consciousness of possessing what is called the detective instinct but at the prospect of this quest so much like that of the proverbial needle in a haystack as i did not even know my sister's married name and something within me forbade my asking it i experienced an odd sense of elation followed by a certainty of success which in five minutes changed me from an irresponsible girl to a woman with a deliberate purpose in life i am not going to write down here all the details of that search some day i may relate them to you but not now i looked first for a beautiful woman for the straight slim and exquisite creature i remembered i did not find her then i tried another course her figure might have changed in the ten years which had elapsed so might her expression i would look for a woman with beautiful dark eyes time could not have altered them i had forgotten the effect of constant weeping and i saw many eyes but not hers not the ones i had seen smiling upon me as i lay in my crib before the days i was lifted to the dignity of the little brass bed so i gave that up too and listened to the inner voice which said you must wait for her to recognize you you can never hope to recognize her and it was by following this plan that i found her i had arranged to have my name spoken aloud at every counter where i bargained and oh the bargains i sought and the garments i had tried on but i made little progress until one day after my name had been uttered a little louder than usual i saw a woman turn from rearranging gowns on a hanger and give me one look i uttered a low cry and sprang impetuously forward instantly she turned her back and went on hanging or trying to hang up gowns on the rack before her had i been mistaken she was not the sister of my dreams but there was something fine in her outline something distinguished in the way she carried her head which next minute my last doubt fled she had fallen her length on the floor and lay with her face buried in her hands in a dead faint oh roger 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 i had that dear head on my breast in a moment i talked to her i whispered prayers in her unconscious ear i did everything i should not have done till they all thought me demented when she came to as she did under other ministrations than mine i was for carrying her off in my limousine but she shook her head with a gesture of such disapproval that i realized i could not do that the limousine was my father's and nothing of his was ever to be used for her again i would call a cab but she told me that she had not the money to pay for it and she would not take mine car fare she had five cents would take her home i need not worry she smiled as she said this and for an instant i saw my dream sister again in this weary half disheartened woman but the smile was a fleeting one for this was to be her last day in the store she had no talent as a saleswoman and was merely working out her week i felt my heart sink heavily at this for the evidences of poverty were plainly to be seen in her clothes and the thinness of her face and figure how could i help what could i do i took her to a restaurant for food and talk and before she would order she looked into her purse with the result that we had only a little toast and tea it was all she could afford and i with a hundred dollars in bills at that moment in my bag could not offer her anything more though she was needing 
nourishment and dishes piled with savoury meats were going by us every moment i think if she had let me i would have dared my father's displeasure and been disobedient to his wishes by giving her one wholesome meal but she was as resolute of mine as he and as she said afterwards had chosen her course in life and must abide by it my love she would accept it took nothing from father and gave her what her heart was pining for had pined for for years but nothing more not another thing more she would not even let me go home with her and i knew why when her eyes fell at the searching look i gave her something would turn up and when her husband's health was better and she had found another position she would send me her address and then i could come and see her as we walked out of the restaurant we ran against a gentleman i knew he stopped me for a passing word and in that minute she disappeared i did not try to follow her i could get her street and number from the store where she had worked but when i had done this and embraced the first opportunity which offered to visit her i found that she had moved away in the interim leaving everything behind in payment of her rent except such small things as she and her husband could carry this was discouraging as it left me without any clue by which to follow them but i was determined not to yield to her desire for concealment in the difficult and disheartening task i now saw before me seeking advice from the man who has since become my employer i entered upon this second search with a quiet resolution which admitted of no defeat it took me six months but i finally found her and satisfied with knowing where she was desisted from rushing in upon her till i had caught one glimpse of her husband whom in the last six months i had heard described but had never seen to understand her it was perhaps necessary to understand him and if i could not hope to do this off-hand i could not fail to get some idea of the man from even the most casual look he was as i soon learned the fetcher and carrier of the small menage and the day came when i met him face to face in the street where they lived did he disappoint me or did i see something in his appearance to justify her desertion of her father's home and her present life of poverty if i say yes to the first question i must also say it to the last if handsome once he was not handsome now but with a personality such as his this did not matter he had that better thing that greatest gift of the gods charm it was in his bearing his movement the regard of his weary eye more than that it was in his very nature or it would have vanished long ago under disappointment and privation but that was all there was to the man a golden net in which my sister's youthful fancy had been caught and no doubt held meshed to this very day i felt less like blaming her for her folly after that instant's view of him as we passed each other in the street but as i took time to think i found myself growing sorrier and sorrier for her and yet in a way gladder and gladder for the man was a physical wreck and would soon pass out of her life leaving her to my love and possibly to our father's forgiveness but i did not know teresa after her husband's death which occurred very soon she let me come to her and we had a long talk shall i ever forget it or the sight of her beauty in that sordid room for account for it as you will the loveliness which had fled under her sense of complete isolation had slowly regained its own with the recognition that she still had a place in the heart of her little sister not even the sorrow she felt for the loss of her suffering husband and she did mourn him this i am glad to say could more than temporarily stay this six months of ease and wholesome food would make her i hardly dared to think what for i knew without asking her or she telling me that she would accept neither that she was as determined now as ever that nothing which came directly or indirectly from father should go to the rebuilding of her life 
that she intended to start anew and work her way up to a place where i should be glad to see her she did say but nothing more she was still the sister mother loving but sufficient to herself though she had but ten dollars left in the world as she showed me with a smile that made her beautiful as an angel i can see that shabby little purse yet with its one poor greasy bill a sum to her but to me the price of a luncheon or a gift of flowers how i longed as i looked at it to tear every jewel from my poor bedecked body and fling them one and all into her lap i had worn them in profusion though carefully hidden under my coat in the hope that she would accept one of them at least but she refused all even such as had been gifts of friends and schoolmates only humoring me this far that she let me hang them for a few minutes about her neck and in her hair and then pull them all off again but this one vision of her in the splendor she was born to comforted me henceforth in wearing them it would be of her and not of myself i should think well i had to leave her and go home to my french and italian lessons my music masters and all the luxuries of our father's house should i ever see her again i did not know she had not promised i could not go often into the quarter where she lived without rousing suspicion and she had bidden me not to come again for a month so i waited half fearing she would flit again before the month was up but she did not she was still there when but i am going too fast the meeting i was about to mention was a very memorable one to me and i must describe it from the beginning i had ridden in my own car as near as i dared to the street where she lived the rest of the way i went on foot with one of the servants a new one following close behind me i was not exactly afraid but the actions of some of the people i had encountered at my former visit warned me to be a little careful for my father's sake if not for my own her room she had but one was high up in a triangular court it was no pleasure to enter but love and loyalty heed nothing but the object sought and i was hunting about for the dark doorway which opened upon the staircase leading to her room when and this was the great moment of my life a sudden stream of melody floated down into that noisome court which from its clearness its accuracy its richness and its feeling startled me as i had never before been startled even by the first notes of the world's greatest singers what a voice for a place like this what a voice for any place whose could it be with a start i stopped short in the middle of that court heedless of the crowd of pushing shouting children who at once gathered about me i had been struck by an old recollection my sister used to sing i remembered where her piano had stood in the great drawing-room it had been carted away during those dreadful weeks and her music all burned but the vision of her graceful figure bending over the keyboard was one not to be forgotten even by a thoughtless child could it be oh heaven if this voice were hers her future was certain she had but to sing in a transport of hope i rushed for the dim entrance the children had pointed out and flew up to her room as i reached it i heard a trill as perfect as tetrazzini's the singer was teresa there could be no doubt teresa exercising a grand voice as only a great artist would or could the joy of it made me almost faint i leaned against her door and sobbed then when i thought i could speak quite calmly i went in roger you must understand me now my desire for money and the means i have taken to obtain it my sister had the makings of a prima donna her husband of whose ability i had formed so low an estimate had trained her with consummate skill and judgment all she needed was a year with some great maestro in the foreign atmosphere of art but this meant money not hundreds but thousands and the one sure source to which we might rightfully look for any such amount was effectually closed to us it is true we had relatives an aunt on our mother's side 
and i mentioned her to teresa but she would not listen to the suggestion she would take nothing from any one whom she would find it hard to face in case of failure love must go with an advance involving so much risk love deep enough and strong enough to feel no loss save that of a defeated hope in short to be acceptable the money must come from me and as this was manifestly impossible she considered the matter closed and began to talk of a position she had been offered in some choir i let her talk listening and not listening for the idea had come to me that if in some way i could earn money she might be induced to take it finally i asked her she laughed letting her kisses answer me but i did not laugh if she had capabilities in one way i had them in another i went home to think two weeks later i began in a very quiet way to do certain work for the man who had helped me in my second search for teresa the money i have earned has been immense since it was troubles of the rich i was given to settle and i was almost always successful every cent has gone to her she has been in europe for a year and last week she made her debut you read about it in the papers but neither you nor any one else in this country but myself knew that under the name she chosen to assume teresa strange the long-forgotten beauty has recovered that place in the world to which her love and genius entitle her this is my story and hers from now on you are the third in the secret some day my father will be the fourth i think then a new dawn of love will arise for us all which will stay the whitening of his dear head for i believe in him after all yesterday when he passed the wall where her picture once hung no other has ever hung there i saw him stop and look up and roger when he passed me a minute later there was a tear in his hard eye end of violet's own end of the golden slipper and other problems for violet strange by anna katherine green